Hello and welcome to That Encyclopedia Podcast with your hosts, me, Will, and Jacob. Hello. Picture this. The year is, let's say, 1945. We're still in the midst of World War II. We are in an office in the United States of America, and at the table we have Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz and General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and the Joint Chiefs of Staff Fleet Admirals Ernest King and William D. Lee. We also have Generals of the Army George Marshall and Hap Arnold. We're sat round a table and we're discussing what are we going to do? What are we going to do about Japan? They must be stopped. The war must be ended. At the time of this meeting, the development of the atomic bomb is essentially complete. The atomic bomb is a viable weapon still in, a, in finalizing stages of development, but not even the Vice President of the United States of America knows about its existence. Only a few people know about the existence of the atomic bomb. Very few outside of the Manhattan Project itself, including the, the President, he knows about the atomic bomb. But who else knows about the atomic bomb? The Soviet spies know about the atomic bomb because they have actually already infiltrated the Manhattan Project quite remarkably. So Soviet spies know about the atomic bomb, but the vice president doesn't. But why am I saying this? We're discussing at our table generals, admirals, chiefs of staff. We're deciding how are we going to end the war? Well, we have to invade Japan, obviously. And this, of course, is a conversation that did happen, didn't it, Jacob? You're quite right. Uh, this conversation went back and forth between such individuals as you've mentioned in the United States military and independently in other allied countries' militaries, um, particularly the Commonwealth countries, and within that, particularly Australia. Um, and eventually these conversations uh, fused together um, the power of conferencing before the internet, like Yalta Conference and things in 1945, led to the conceptualization and development, which reached reasonably late stages of planning at least, um, to what was deemed Operation Downfall, which is uh, the proposed Allied plan for the invasion of the Japanese home islands near the end of World War II. However, it was never implemented because ultimately uh, the US took the decision that um, dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, uh, might prove sufficient by themselves and indeed uh, Japan uh, surrendered unconditionally um, not long afterwards in August uh, 1945, 15th of August 1945. So Operation Downfall is best known as a source of speculative fiction, by which I mean uh, books, mm, podcasts, hey, um, and debates, academic debates between historians, between um, uh, ethicists, between uh, students of politics and uh, military studies. What would have happened? What would have changed? And perhaps more subtly, what would have not changed if uh, Operation Downfall were uh, to be enacted um, in lieu of or um, following the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki if for whatever reason Japan did not surrender uh, when it did in 1945. And it's a chunky article on Wikipedia for a military operation that never actually uh, took place which I think is a testament to how seriously it was being considered by various powers, albeit to varying degrees of confidence and um, mm -hmm. rationality. Will, what, was your, uh, what were your first impressions when reading about Operation Downfall? It's an interesting concept because it, the existence of it seems obvious, but I'd never 
never conceived of it before. I'd never thought about it in the context of the world wars and history of World War Two. Um, and of course, it was pretty close to a reality. I mean, if you think about the uh, development of cutting edge technology, which I suppose you could call the atomic bomb, it wouldn't have been uh, an outrageous hypothetical to imagine the bomb taking another year or two years to develop. And if that were the case, well, maybe this would have happened. Another thing that I found interesting was the mention of, again, um, the Soviet Union had its closely kept secrets and also kept closely the secrets of allies and foe. So whilst they knew about the development of the atomic bomb, we did not know about their plans that they were drawing up to invade Hokkaido, I believe. So that's the northern major island of Japan. And mm. if that were to have taken place, that would have happened uh, many months before the, um, the Allied plan for Operation Downfall was supposed to go ahead. And if that were to have happened, it may have accelerated plans to invade Japan. So there's just a lot of ifs and a lot of, yeah, a lot of what if questions here. And I suppose that's what's most interesting about this. I mean, it's the, the reason why uh, alternate history is uh, relatively recently um, done quite well. For it, like the uh, you've definitely heard of the Amazon Prime TV series Man in the High Castle, <laughs> but that explores mm. um, alternate history in particular, alternate history pertaining to events as huge as <laughs> the world wars and the outcomes of the world wars. Because we, especially with the way we we depict world wars and in particular World War Two. Um, and I'm sure we mentioned this in the in our video on attack on Pearl Harbor, but the the war very much felt like a, and still to this day is often depicted, in, in some ways, maybe even reasonably, as a good versus bad conflict, <laughs> and so the concept of things going differently, in particular the concept of the Allies losing World War Two, is quite intriguing. But this is obviously, it's not quite that, but it is tangential to that because we can imagine the plan, we can imagine Operation Downfall, but of course uh, invading the islands of Japan was a plan that Japan expected, so they also had their counter plan. So we can't simply imagine, okay, no atomic bomb, Japan's invaded by the Allies, that's it, easy, done, quick. Because depending on the choice of defensive strategy, it could have got very messy. And there is a large section of this article called Estimated Casualties, which I think addresses some of this the concerns that some of the senior planners had with the uh, projected casualties of, of um, uh, proceeding with um, Operation Downfall. Maybe we should discuss the uh, kind of the, the, the grounded, the real history um, uh, first, and then proceed with various speculative prongs into different scenarios um, rack, our, rack our, our brains um, I wanted to actually draw your attention first to the fact that Operation Downfall is split into uh, two kind of sub-operations if you will um, the first was called Operation Olympic and the second uh, was called Operation Corinth and the objective of Olympic, the first part, was to essentially create a uh, beachhead, but on a national scale on one of Japan's most southern islands uh, called uh, Kyushu, I think. I do not speak Japanese. But even Operation Olympic 
uh, involved the commitment of almost a million uh, personnel, almost all of them American. This was an American operation first and foremost, and the Americans are actually quite reluctant to include their allies in, in a planned invasion of the home islands until reasonably late in um, in their senior meetings. Um, further to the uh, the actual figure is about seven hundred and six thousand personnel required. A hundred and thirty seven thousand vehicles of all types would be needed. This is just for the first stage, remember, Operation Olympic. The deadweight tons of shipping that all of this would total to is 1.2 million for um, a administrative division into uh, 11 infantry divisions, three marine divisions, and 40 air groups. Um, as you've mentioned, the Japanese had their own counter plan because the geography of Japan was really on their side. Um, the island um, structure means that there are very few locations around the home islands that would easily facilitate a full-scale invasion that would be required and given the islands <clears throat> that were under control of Japan versus the islands that were under the control of the US in the Pacific at the time they were able to predict with complete accuracy that an invasion more or less needed to be launched on Kyushu by the Allies. Obviously the Soviet Union had its own um, speculative invasion plans for Hokkaido, the northern island, underway, but downfall did not involve the Soviet Union at all. Um, the proposed date for this was sometime in November, it was never finalised, but whatever calendar date was given, the name for the first day of the invasion was X Day, just how uh, the invasion for uh, uh, Normandy uh, in the European theatre in 1945 was called D-Day. Um, by the new year, in 1946 this would now be, the Allies hoped to be able to initiate uh, Operation Coronet, which would see um, the reinforcements of armoured divisions uh, as, long as, as well as the uh, multiplication of existing forces and a general thrust, for want of a better term, up the island um, towards uh, Kyoto. Um, but the main, well, there were several difficulties in doing this, but I think the, the, the most unique one when discussing a planned invasion of the Japanese home islands was the overwhelming civilian hostility that the planners were expecting. Japan had, uh, well, still does in some ways, has a long history of nationalism, uh, extreme nationalism at that. At the time, this was manifested as uh, life and limb to the emperor. It was a, a, a great and a noble thing to die for your country and to die for your emperor. And every man, woman and child was expected to mm, throw themselves using any weapons they could find, no uniforms, in a guerrilla style uh, strategy at the invading white devils as Japanese propaganda uh, had named the Americans and other allied nations. It's obviously not realistic to expect literally every Japanese citizen to participate but nevertheless allied planners were uh, I would say considerably concerned um, that this guerrilla style warfare waged by citizens and not even the military um, could pose a serious threat to uh, a successful invasion because of course even if you succeed in reaching the capital and threatening to burn it down it's not the Napoleonic Wars anymore that's not really good enough you then have to be able to hold and pacify a location for want of a better term. For this reason uh, in the late stages of planning before the actual surrender happened and made all of it uh, mute um, the United States Navy in particular uh, have become increasingly opposed to uh, Operation Olympic. Um, estimates of casualties were getting higher and probably more accurate and um, <clears throat> uh, the admirals in charge of the US Navy who would be required to uh, supply the ships and transport vessels and amphibious assault vehicles and so forth for the invasion um, had, uh, had reached a stage where they were willing to um, uh, 
uh, objected strongest possible terms to the president and other senior figures. But, well, let's say that Operation Downhall, uh, Downfall went ahead. As you mentioned in the introduction, the development of a nuclear bomb was complete. Maybe even Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been... Uh, had, had, it would, would have still been um, targets for the nuclear program. So isn't there a significant risk that because the effects of uh, nuclear radiation were not particularly well understood yet, um, a lot of Americans and allied soldiers, not to mention the Japanese um, military and civilians involved, would have been fatally poisoned by the fallout from nuclear bombs detonated far too close um, to their combat zones. I'm afraid I don't know very much about nuclear bombs, but <laughs> that sounds like a like a legitimate concern. Um, certainly, I, I've actually there was an interesting sentence I thought uh, early on, which was this sentence here: "Once the atomic bomb became available." General Marshall envisioned General Marshall, a good name, I'll point that out that's a good <laughs> a good military commanding name <laughs> envisioned using the atomic bomb to support the invasion if sufficient numbers could be produced in time now how many atomic bombs did he have in mind? I think the article mentioned that the, uh, the Manhattan program had promised seven by X day, and they're anticipating another 12 by the new year, or something like that. So, kind of around a dozen um, additional See, nuclear bombs. Were that is an incredible amount of destructive power. Yeah, it's scary. So, the, the of course, we're realistically, we're in terms of the nuclear capability, we're living in an age far worse, but. In terms of like the, 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 the tangible, realistic, highly believable um, risk of it being used in the immediate future. Now that that is an interesting and frightening concept, isn't it? That the military leaders of this program could have considered using a huge number of, of nuclear weapons in their plans mm -hmm. um, but on, on a non-nuclear note one of the interesting ways of, of trying to like conceptualize the scale of this of this plan even if no nuclear weapons were used mm. um, so I, just for any listeners I, I don't expect everyone to know that much about World War II history. Certainly, I don't know very much about World War II history, but um, this would have been the largest amph amphibian op or amphibious operation in in the history of amphibious warfare. So the concept of um, pulling things out of the sea and deploying them on the land to to invade a country. It was just a, a of a colossal scale, and the largest that has actually occurred in real history was D-Day. So the Normandy landings, when Allied forces invaded Normandy and began to advance on liberating France, and that was the foundation. One could reasonably argue of the Allied victory against the uh, against the forces of Nazi Germany on the Western Front. So, and just to to, to give some uh, some numerical data to to back up what you're saying, um, the order of battle for the Armada present during this hypothetical X day included no fewer than forty two aircraft carriers um, f for reference the our country uh, that is Will and I were both British um, the UK's Royal Navy is still regarded as one of the best um, uh, in the world but even the UK only has 
uh, two aircraft carriers, uh, to my knowledge, I think. Obviously, uh, the US has many more than this. I don't have the exact figure, but 42 aircraft carriers is an insane number, supported further by 24 battleships and no fewer than 400 destroyers and destroyer escorts, all with a single purpose, which is to invade the Japanese home island of Kyushu. This would have been warfare on a scale, I, I, I think, not, not seen ever, never seen um, in human history. Uh, maybe kind of Operation Barbarossa, which was the Nazi plan that was executed to invade Russia in its early stages when everyone was at kind of full strength and going full tilt, it comes close on from a land perspective. But you're completely correct, Will, I think, from an amphibious uh, history of amphibious warfare perspective uh, this this is uh, probably a military planner's nightmare actually, worst nightmare to have to manage all of this and mm. this was exacerbated by um, the, the considerable risk posed by the Japanese defence, who were obviously not just going to roll over and, and take it the Japanese uh, plan to defend against this X day, uh, an operation downfall was called Operation Katsugo and it was considerably more sophisticated than the Allies really gave them credit for. Is that is that fair to say, Will? Was that your opinion as well, reading through this? Um, I'm not sure. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if that was a realistic interpretation, but that's that's the, tends to be my escape line. That wouldn't surprise me. But yeah, the, the <laughs> I think the uh, Japanese were prepared I mean under understandably from what you were describing earlier in in terms of the um, imperialist fervor that there was I mean obviously especially within the military there was a significant plan to um, deploy more than 10,000 um kamikaze aircraft uh newly built suicide boats so they 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 their plans involved plenty of casualties on their own side simply to fend off an invasion of of their homeland so yeah i think they were really prepared to go to uh all extremes possibly yeah well let's no go on let well, I was just saying, let, let's take that number, right? 10,000 aircraft. Kam uh, I don't know if they're all kamikaze aircraft, but um, in the Allies' initial evaluation of the air threat posed from uh, Japanese defensive forces, uh, military intelligence initially estimated the number of Japanese aircraft to be at about 2,500. Now, to be fair, that is an initial estimate, and it did increase over time. But by the time the war ended in mid-August, the Japanese had... 13,000 aircraft and this is three or four months before X Day was even supposed to begin and they were in full production right up until um, the atomic bombings so you can imagine by the time late autumn uh, came around uh, the number of airplanes would be able to block out the sun I would expect and the Japanese special attack forces uh, which was the military's term for suicide squads basically kamikaze for aircraft and then they also had boats and people with mines strapped to them and um uh suicide frogmen as well who were uh, military divers um didn't need to succeed that often to be effective um i think during the uh taking of okinawa which is probably the famous um uh certainly the most brutal and extended component of the u.s uh, military's island hopping campaign in the run up to what would be Operation Downfall. Uh, the success of kamikaze uh, attacks was something like one in nine, so about 11 percent ish. And due to the favorable terrain, a defensive advantage uh, that Japan had, the increased number and advances in the excuse me, in their kamikaze technology. Uh, as well as additional personnel available, uh, Japanese military planners estimated they could increase that value to about one in six, uh, which is considerable. And although 42 aircraft carriers sounds like a lot, 
if you lose any of them, that's going to be a significant blow to not only your naval forces, but then also by extension your air coverage, because you can't launch as many planes, and that makes it more likely that the next one gets through, and you can quickly lead to this sort of domino effect. Mm. My your thoughts overall are just that provide cover for your ground units either. Precisely. Continue. So overall, I would I would say that it's just a very good thing that this never happened because uh, modern casualty estimates put. Uh, but both sides are uh, surpassing one million, usually. Uh, it's higher for the Japanese, but um, millions are dead, wounded, missing. Um, it is an if incredible nukes are involved. scale. Mm. And if nukes were, were involved, that increases further, plus radioactive fallout and the destruction of uh, an ancient and proud country. So, scary stuff. And uh, the that's, that's why it's so popular as speculative fiction, I would imagine. Mm. Well, I want to draw your attention to one more interesting and nicely named um, thing uh, relating to this um, the reevaluation of Operation Olympic. So, and this is um, a development by by August nineteen forty five. The estimate for the number of ground forces in Kyushu had uh, about doubled in terms of how many how many people they were expecting to encounter there um, and this this was an identification done by something called magic cryptanalysis isn't that a good term it is i saw that but i i, I pursued other rabbit holes reading this article and magic cryptography was not one of them <laughs> have you investigated this term um for, I, well, I clicked on it and that's about it it's a uh, an, a cryptanalysis um again that's you can click on that to find out what that is it's just a, the concept of breaching cryptographic security systems so decrypting messages basically and magic is the name for a particular project that occurred in World War Two, involving the U.S. Army's Signals Intelligence Service. Um, the SIS. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, they use this to get an idea of where the Japanese forces were moving, and um, actually, they, in terms of southern Kyushu, they identified three times as many troops as they had previously estimated. So they'd seriously, seriously un underestimated the resistance that they would have got in Operation Olympic. Yes, and I think it's, I, I should point out as well that the Japanese defensive plan was very much an all or nothing scenario. They committed the vast majority of their available professional forces to the defense of Kyushu and if that didn't work uh, which would mean um, if Operation Olympic was successful and Operation Coronet was proceeding according to the Allies plan um, it would become strictly a guerrilla warfare uh, situation with the exception of kind of the final um, Imperial Guard and elite military uh, uh, forces in in the defense of Kyoto um, Whereas I think the Allies were perhaps expecting more of a traditional um, progression where the initial landing is contested heavily but not completely and a, a decent number of available forces are kept in reserve to enable a defence in depth strategy as it would be called in, in um, military science which kind of allows you to take full advantage of the terrain as the uh, campaign continues by committing everything to one location if you have made a blunder or a miscalculation or if you simply get unlucky and end up losing then you're done and all of the advantages you could have pressed through a defense in depth uh, strategic um, uh, plan uh, is sort of sacrificed um, but certainly it, it spooked allied planners enough that they were reconsidering although they would have probably uh, gone ahead the article seems to 
indicate, regardless of any hesitations, because the alternative was besieging the whole country uh, through a naval blockade and trying to starve Japan out, which would have lasted years. And uh, the US in particular was concerned about the effect on home population morale in such a scenario. So they were enthusiastic to press ahead with a military invasion plan, even though that would have inevitably led to hundreds of thousands, probably millions of casualties. They felt it was the long-term healthier way to neutralize Japan and end World War II at long last. What a concept. <laughs> well, we hope you've enjoyed pondering about things that were so close to having been but did not happen and what they say about humanity and about war and hopefully you'll join us next time for another podcast until then Thank you.